Greetings, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be part seven of the Peace and Safety series. This should be the last one. This is going to be the book of Revelation that we're going to be taking our probably the great majority of our scripture from. Now, the thing is, when the beast system is installed, it's going to be, it's going to involve worship, religion, a one world religion, and either you will worship the beast or you will be killed. It will involve it will be economic. You will either take the mark or you will not be able to buy or sell. And it will be military as well because the false prophet is going to be able to call down fire from the sky just like Elijah did. And I covered that in a previous study. And the fire from the sky will just burn up their enemies. So we will cover this in more detail and then close this out. Now, one thing I do want to point out, when the false prophet starts doing miracles, I suspect that he's going to sort of kind of mimic the ministry of John the Baptist. And I personally, my opinion, if I was the devil, I would try to mimic as many of the Old Testament prophecies as possible to make it appear that their Messiah has come. You know, perhaps the Messiah being born in Bethlehem. Uh, you know, when uh, John the Baptist was the uh, messenger in the wilderness. So I'll cover this as we go along. But after I have a feeling, this is my opinion, is that the great all, I've, I'm sure that almost all the people of the earth that are non-Christians will follow the beast. And pretty much that's what the Bible says. And I'll cover that in a bit. I think the only people that are going to not follow the beast are going to be the true, blood-washed, born-again Christians that know their Bible. Your pre-trib dispensational, dispensational, dispensational uh, churchianity, Zio worshippers, uh, I'm sure, you know, as long as John Hagee says it, they're going to follow along. One thing I should mention, there was one group about two, um, over, well, Almost 20 years ago, well, almost uh, uh, almost 20 years ago, that almost had me fooled. And they were called the Reformed Movement. They're, they're usually considered Calvinistic. They believe in election. And they believe that when the church starts following God's law, that the Holy Spirit will fill the world and Christ will come in. So it's the church's duty to get the whole world to follow God's laws and then the Holy Spirit will have Christ return. And I didn't understand it at first, but it sounded kind of good on the surface. And they were what you call preterists. And then somebody wrote me a comment today, yesterday, and said that uh, James White was one of them, said that all the 
Bible prophecies were fulfilled in 70 AD except for the coming of Christ. Well, in the last study that I just did, number 6, Matthew 24, the Bible plainly teaches, Jesus plainly teaches in Mark 13 of Matthew 24 that the false Christ will come first. I mean, when Jesus returns, every eye will see him. Think about Project Blue Beam. Look that up, Project Blue Beam. Some people say that it's uh, computer-generated imaging, CGI. Um, I don't know. They got holograms now that look pretty stinking amazing, I'm telling you. I haven't seen them in person, so I don't know. Maybe they're right. Maybe they're wrong. I don't know. But all I know is if Project Blue Beam is true, they can fake a coming of a messiah. Whether they call it Christ or not, I don't know. But the, my point is, as I pointed out in the last study, if we're not caught up together in the air to be with him, it's the wrong messiah. And all these reformed people that are preterists, uh, they're all going to be fooled. Your dispensational, Zio-worshipping, pre-trib rapture people, they're all going to be deceived. Uh, maybe not ever, maybe not 100%, just, you know, 99 point whatever. Probably. I mean, look at Jerusalem. Uh, the Bible records that I think it's seven or 8,000 people will give glory to God during the tribulation. And, you know, even if Jerusalem has... Um, only one million people. I mean, that's that's like one percent, less than one percent. Think about it, people. That's not much of a remnant. And uh, so that's that's kind of how my take on it. And I don't claim to be a prophet. I don't claim to have any special knowledge. I'm just some guy that's read the Bible a couple of times and trust me, I never wanted to be a Bible teacher. I did not want it. But I was studying, 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 studying. Finally, the Spirit just convicted me and you know, I realized there was just so many false teachers out there and I just felt like, well, if not me, who is going to teach? And you know I don't do this for money. I had one person write me and say, oh, they knew I was a fraud because I got a, a mansion on the beach. And I wrote them back and I said, would you please give me the address of this my mansion on the beach? Because, boy, I'd sure like to go see it and take, you know, go live in it. Of course, I couldn't afford the insurance, you know, <laughs> you know. I, you know, you know what insurance costs for a mansion on the beach? Uh, the homeowners? Oh, boy. Yeah. I'm not even I'm sure I can afford the water bill and the, the electric. You know? But, uh, yeah, please, if you, if you know where my mansion on the beach is, please let me know because I'd sure like to go check it out, you know? Um I have a feeling my mansion's going to be somewhere else um, after Christ returns, but I don't know. Am I worthy? Absolutely not. All right, well, this is the introduction to the end, uh, peace and safety. So let's take a look. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 3. For when they shall say peace and safety... Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now, why are they going to say peace and safety? Because all the enemies of the, the beast are going to be destroyed. And that's going to be a very, very, very small remnant of Christians. Very small, my opinion. You know very small so all right let's take a look 
All right, let's take a look. We're going to skip around a little bit, and I'll probably end up reading this entire chapter, but uh, we're going to do chapter Revelation chapter 13. And uh, let's see, verse 16. Revelation 13 and verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And like I mentioned in a previous study, it could very well, I'm not saying it is, but if it is some type of a microchip, it would fit the bill. I mean, your driver's licenses, if you've got an ID 2020, it's got a microchip in it. You got a passport? Microchip. You got an ATM card? Microchip. Credit card? Microchip. Suppose they combine them your banking and your identification for the government services. And then they decide, well, you know, and we've got to have your vaccination. Somebody said to me, COVID-19, you know what that actually stands for? COVID-19, Certificate of Vaccination, COV, ID-19, COVID-19, Certificate of Vaccination, ID-19. They could put your health information on this chip. They could put your identification. They could put your banking information on this chip. And let's face it, you can lose your wallet, you can lose your purse, but if we put it in your right hand or on your forehead, it's kind of hard to lose your forehead or your right hand. Some people are born without arms, some people lose their arms. Well, let's put it on their forehead. So, guess what? It's, you know, what's somebody going to do when they want to do identity theft and or steal your money out of the bank? Are they going to cut your cut your hand off or cut your head off and go up and say, "Oh, here, I want to take some money out of the bank." Uh, no. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Now, you got a choice. The mark of the beast, or the seal of God. And no, we're not talking about an animal that swims in the ocean that, you know, polar bears like to eat. No, not that kind of a seal. So, the mark is a mark of ownership. And let's face it, most people are right-handed. You know, what you do with your hand, your forehead, your mind, you know. Are you going to serve the beast with your hands and with your mind? Um, Arnold Murray pointed that out, and... You know, I wouldn't disagree with that. So it's going to be the total package. Verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let he that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. Six, six, six. And if that number was embedded in a microchip, unless you had a reader, a microchip reader, or and or a uh, knowledge of computer languages how would you know how would you know all right so the beast system is going to be economic you will either worship the beast or you will not buy food i actually remember a woman or man i forget about eh, 15 years ago that said well, you know, God's going to forgive me for taking the mark of the beast because i got to feed my children. Really? The Bible says if you take the mark, you go into the lake of fire, period. You know, I, I don't care what they say about once saved, always saved, eternal security. I don't care. Jesus said, you take the mark, lake of fire, period, end of story. And besides, it's a denial of faith. You know, you don't 
God fed Israel in the wilderness with manna for 40 years after the exodus in, from Egypt. 40 years they fed them with manna. You refuse the mark of the beast? You don't think he could do the same thing for you now? It's a, it's a total lack of faith. Total lack of faith. Matter of fact, it's a denial. It's a denial of the faith. Now, um, I want to point something out. I read this in a previous Bible study. Oh, and by the way, if you're interested in Elijah the prophet, I did two Bible studies on Elijah. I will post them in the comments. And oh, by the way, BitChute is, uh, because of disgust, well, they call it disgust, but D-I-S-C-U-S or whatever. But I say disgust, as in I'm disgusted with them. They are horribly censoring comments now. This is a real new thing. Matter of fact, I can't even post pictures anymore. Because I was posting pictures with uh, Bible things and what have you. And, uh, you know, pictures of... Uh, a certain people with Epstein and uh, certain people in political office, if you catch my drift. I don't even want to say his name. He's up for re-election against Joe. Yeah, his name's Don. Old. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so I don't know. Things are really heating up. I, um, I did a video like three years ago about internet censorship coming. I saw it coming, but uh, BitChute looks like their comment system is horrible. It's the same comment system that um, Bright Eon had. I could not even comment on my own channel with Bright Eon. That's why I'm I I gave it up. You know, Mike Adams is a gatekeeper for sure. I mean, you know, when, when you're a content owner, channel, you know, when it's your channel, when you're a channel author, and you can't even comment on your own channel, that's horrible. So I gave it up. But BitChute is going down the same hole, I guess you could say, down towards the pit of hell. All right, so, all right, let's go to 2 Kings chapter one. Now remember, Elijah is going to be one of the two prophets that confronts the beast in the end times. Um, and I will guess I'll prove that too. So now he was uh, he was there during the reign of King Ahab and Jezebel. King Ahab was bad. Jezebel was even worse. I mean, they were bad news. And I covered that in a previous study. So, 2 Kings 1, verse 9. Then the king sent unto him a captain of 50 with his 50. All right, so this is a about a quarter of the size of a company of men. A company is about 200. This is about a the same, you know, quarter of the size. Or... For those of you that were in the military, this is a very large platoon. Three to four squads. Girls, it probably wouldn't make any sense to you unless you'd been in the military. So I'm just pointing that out. You know, 50 guys to get this one prophet. I mean, that is like overkill. However, God had a different plan. Then the king sent to him a captain of 50 with his 50, and he went up to him, and behold, he sat on top of an hill, and he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down from fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. So, Elijah just spoke the words and said, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. 
boom, these guys are gone. They're burned up. And I don't think they were smoldering corpses on the ground. I don't think so. I think they were just totally burned up. Maybe not even a whiff of smoke left of them. Just gone. But that's just my opinion. I can't prove it. You know? And can you imagine people watching this? 50 men marching up to the hill where Elijah is? <laughs> you know? And then they see fire come down from heaven and they're gone? Woof! Uh, yeah. And then it happens again in verses 11 and 12. So, boom. You know? Just remember something. The false prophet is also going to have this kind of miracle happen to him. The Lord's going to allow the false prophet to have this kind of miracle happen, this kind of power. Now, what kind of people are going to be able to stand and fight against the beast? Hmm. And like I say, if you're interested, I've got an hour and 40 minutes study of Elijah. And then I got another study on Elijah. And you can take a look at them if you're interested. For as lever long as I am on YouTube, I don't know. But Bitty, Bright Eon's gone. Uh, Bitshoot's not looking too good. So, like I say, if anybody's interested, um, get my address, send me a USB thumbnail drive, thumb drive, and I'll copy everything. It's got to be at least 64 gig. And um, like I say, I don't copyright anything. It's all to the glory of God. Uh, use it, post it anywhere, you know. And like I say, I don't do this for money. If I'm doing this for money, I'm... I'm, this is a horrible return on investment, I'll tell you what. You know, I'm self-funded here. I just spent 200 and something dollars on a uh, this microphone. I bought a brand new microphone up in Arkansas, and the, uh, the goat up there won't give it back. It's funny, I worked for him for two months over two months with no pay invested a bunch of money in that clown's uh, goat's uh, farm and he says I ripped him off unbelievable so yeah when he started talking about blowing up synagogues I was like up oh, I better get out of here so whatever pray for me people it's real. It's real. All right. Now, in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5, we read, um, I think Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, the, uh, well, let's take a look at John. Now, in Isaiah 40, in verse 3, we read, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. All right. And that is mentioned in Matthew 3.3. 3. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, everybody was looking for Elijah, and yet the Lord sent John the Baptist. 
the voice of one crying in the wilderness to make the way for the Lord. And they came to John and they asked him, Are you Elijah? And he said, No. And there's people that will tell you that, Oh yeah, well, John didn't know what he was talking about. He was really Elijah. If that's true, then believe in reincarnation. Be a Buddhist or something. You know, John knew he who he was. He knew he was not Elijah. He came in the spirit and the power of Elijah, yes, most certainly. Now there's a verse in Matthew 17, verse 10, and his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias, or Elijah, must, come for, uh, must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall come first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is already come, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. But the thing is, he came in the spirit and the power of Elias. John, John knew who he was. Come on. I mean, even the angel Gabriel even um, said to uh, Elizabeth, thou shalt call his name John. I mean, if he was Elias or Elijah, he would have called him that. All right, let's take a look at Luke chapter 1. I want to drive this point home. Verse 5, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zecharias of the house of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they were both now, they both were now well stricken in years. They were old, just like me. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. I guess that's what you call holy smoke, right? And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And I don't mean to be make a light joke there, but uh, that's what I always said when the you know saw the Catholic Church burning the incense, holy smoke, right? But, uh, all right, verse 11. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name Elijah? No. No. Elias? No. And thou shalt call his name John, John the Baptist. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Many, not all. For he shall be great, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Listen carefully. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. So he was in the spirit and power of Elias. Elijah. That's just a Greek rendering of Elijah. You know, John knew who he was. John was not Elias. He came in the spirit and power of, and he, shall, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, when the... Um, Sin 
sin of Gog, of Satan, when they have their little Passover thing, thingy, they always set an extra plate at the table, they say, for Elijah. Because they are expecting Elijah. Well, guess what? I am totally convinced that the false prophet will claim to be Elijah. He's going to be able to bring fire down from the sky, the same as Elijah did. And then he's going to prepare the way for his Messiah, the beast. At least that's how I see it. Satan might throw a curveball to me, and I might strike out, but uh, I don't think so. It seems to line up with Scripture. All right, let's take a look. All right, we're back at Revelation 13. I guess we're going to read the chapter. Uh, all right, so I showed you where the beast system is going to be economic. Now it's going to be a total military uh, system, complete military domination uh, for a while anyways. Uh, the only two people that are going to be able to oppose the beast system are going to be Elijah and whoever the second witness is. Some people say Moses, some say Enoch. I don't know. I'm I tend to believe Enoch um, because he, him and Elijah are the only two people that never died. And others say Moses because of the transfiguration, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, when Jesus was transfigured before them, Elijah and Moses was there with him. Uh, Jesus was the Fulfillment of the law and the prophets, which is what Moses represented, the, pro, uh, the law. Moses represented the law, and Elijah represented the prophets. You know, the Bible's a seamless book, if you ask me. I, I just, that's why I'm so long-winded. I find so many, you start going into one theme, and then you end up doing another. So, all right, let's take a look at Revelation 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, Okay, he's trying to mimic the uh, lion of the tribe of Judah. And the dragon gave him his power. And if you don't know who the dragon is, the dragon is the devil and Satan. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Let's face it, there was a war in heaven. Why? Because Satan wanted God's position. Satan wanted to be worshipped. Sorry, but that position was already filled and uh, did, things didn't work out for him too well. So he was cast out of heaven and now he's on the earth trying to destroy God's plans here on the earth. Read Job 1. You know, if you didn't listen to all the previous studies on this, you should. Job chapter 1 shows that Satan has some a certain amount of power. Satan brought fire down from the sky too. And the false prophet's going to do it. But, so you got the beast, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Verse 4. And they worshipped the dragon. Wow. They don't want Christ as king. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, 
Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And the answer is, only the Lord of lords and King of kings. That's the answer. Who's able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That's about three and a half years, people. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Now, who's this talking about? Well, if you ask a pre-tribber, oh, well, that's the you-know-who's. Because they're not the pre-tribbers. We're not going to be here. We're going to be up in heaven having the marriage supper of the Lamb, getting eating, drinking, and being merry while all the rest of humanity is getting slaughtered on earth, uh, getting killed, and getting their heads cut off for not denying Christ. And that's what they get for uh, because they didn't believe in the pre-trib rapture. They, you know, I've actually heard people say this. If you don't believe in the pre-trib rapture, you're not going to go. I'm like, where's that? Oh, that's right. That's in the Gospel of Judas, the 66th chapter and the 6th verse. Yeah, Judas 66 and 6. Yeah, that's where that is. So meanwhile, they're having a ball. And everybody else is getting slaughtered down here because, you know, they just didn't believe in the pre-trib rapture or they didn't accept Christ quick enough. Yeah, that's, they actually teach this garbage. And, and you can't convince them they're wrong. God blinds them. Why? Because they bless those that curse and hate his only begotten son, Jesus. I'd deceive them too. And I did that in a Bible study on this series. So, uh, what can I tell you? And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world i've had people tell me that everybody's names written in the lamb's book of life everybody's names in the bram's look book of life and all they got to do to keep it there is just believe in jesus uh really Really? I don't think so. Ugh. No. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Not everybody's names are written in the book of life. You think Esau's name is written in the book of life? God hated Esau. Malachi chapter 1. Read it read it people you think you think esau somebody that hates god and god hates is going to be in the kingdom has an opportunity to be in the kingdom i don't think so i mean you can believe that if you want to but when esau's not there you know you can ask gee where's esau oh well he's he's holding hands with judas iscariot and satan and the false prophet, and the beast. They're all holding hands singing Kumbaya. Probably singing How Dry I Am. Verse 9. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. If the Lord is to let you go into the captivity, you're going to go. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now, thus saith Bob, 
I believe that if we're to go into captivity and the Lord wants it and you kill somebody with a gun or a knife to keep yourself from going into captivity, the way that you killed will be the way you die. But if it's your lot in life to go into captivity, to go before the, the councils and in the sin of Gogs, to be tried for your faith and get your head cut off, just remember, it's a guaranteed ticket to heaven. Uh, Matthew, I think it's Matthew 24 or Mark 13, um, it says, don't even think about what you're going to say at, the, at your trial, because the Holy Ghost will speak through you. Maybe I should look that up. But uh, those are supposed to be killed for their faith. You're going to be killed for your faith as a testimony against them. You know, and if we're supposed to do it, we're supposed to do it, not fight. Now, if they want to kill you because of your skin color, fight them. But if they come out and say, Christian, come out. And another thing, if there's a trial to convict you of being a Christian, is there enough evidence to find you guilty? Think about that. Do they have enough evidence to, to find you guilty of being a Christian? I was wrong. Matthew chapter 10, verse 17. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their sin of Gog's. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. And when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you." Ah, I was partly right. Mark 13, verse 9. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils and in the sin of Gogs. Ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. So it's, you know, now the brother shall betray the brother to death and the father to the son, and children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Verse 13, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You know, these once saved, always saved crowd, why don't they believe this? But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I mean, the Bible, Jesus said, if you deny me before men, you know, basically, I'm going to paraphrase, but, you know, to save your life, if you deny him before, uh, before men, Jesus said he'd deny you before the Father and his angels. So, you know, if you save your life, you're going to lose it. And if you lose your life for the gospel's sake, you'll find it. Period. And then again in Matthew 10 and verse 18, And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them. A testimony against them and the Gentiles. All right, let's go back to Revelation 13. Uh, okay, verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So here it is, the, the dragon, Satan, 
is trying to horns like a lamb. He's trying to appear to be a lamb, like a lamb of God, but really he's a dragon. Verse 12, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and, the, and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, and he doeth great wonders, miracles, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Just like Elijah. And what do you want to bet that this one, uh, the false prophet, will claim to be Elijah? To fool the stupid people that don't know their Bible. I can almost guarantee that. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Okay, remember where it says, and who could make war with the beast? How can you fight somebody that can bring fire down from the sky and burn you to cinders, to ashes? How can you fight that? You can't. You can't. So if we're supposed to go into captivity, go into captivity. The Lord will speak through you at the trial as a testimony against them. And when you get your head cut off, you'll close your eyes, get your head cut off. And when you open your eyes, you'll be with Christ forever. Think about that, people. You know, I've talked to so many people. They... They think this is the wrath of God. They're idiots. They're idiots. This is not the wrath of God. This is the wrath of Satan against the church. Oh, but I can't. The church isn't mentioned in the book of Revelation after chapter 3 until you get to the end. Well, that's because you're not looking. That's because you think the Antichrist, plural, is the bride is the woman. You think the Antichrist, plural, is the woman. You're not looking for the church. That's why you can't find her. I'm reading about the church now. Well, I just did. They're going to be, they're going to be taken before councils and beaten as a testimony against them. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Okay. So the beast system is going to be economic. It's going to be military. Complete domination. Now it's going to be religious worship. Verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Huh. And then you could, you know, we just read uh, the mark of the beast in verse 16, 17, and 18. So let's skip that. I'm going to try to keep this under an hour. Ah, uh, not a chance. This is going to be over an hour. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Yeah, this is another one of Paul's writings where he, Paul gives you a lot of warnings about the end times, man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, the antichrist. Um, that's why they hate Paul. That's why they want you to throw away his writings and doubt his words. Listen to this and tell me this doesn't tie into Revelation. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. 
Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. That's what Jesus warned in Matthew 24. Don't be deceived. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, what day? The second coming. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that's where we are today, people. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And unless this happened in 70 AD, it has to be the future, people. And I don't think it happened in 70 AD, and I covered that in the last study. Verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And uh, your Schofield Zio worshipers will tell you that's the Holy Ghost that's taken out of the way, removed from the earth. People, nobody can get saved without the Holy Ghost. Nobody. If the Holy Ghost is removed, there's no way to be saved. Matter of fact, um, your dispensational sational, um, pre-tribbers, they actually teach, and I know this for a fact, I went to one of their Bible colleges, I've got a master's degree from one of their Bible colleges, I know exactly what they teach. They teach that after the pre-trib rapture, that the age of church age of grace is closed, and then now it reverts back to the law which is another gospel, people. Paul said that um, anybody that teaches another gospel is cursed. And that's what it is. So they teach that you're going to have to either die for the faith or you're going to have to keep the law. So to keep the law, the Jews got to build a temple. And you're going to have to get some sheep and goats and maybe some lambs and oxen and have them, you know. Uh, gee, Mr. Rabbi Priest, can you sacrifice this uh this uh animal for me uh, you know the age of grace is closed and um i got to keep the law now with you what yeah they do they teach this they won't tell you that but they do they teach this you know schofield and uh larkin clarence larkin i call him the clown larkin and what kills me is you can't find anything about Larkin's life. He could have been the um, Jack the Ripper in London. There's no, there, I can't find any information on him on the internet. Nothing. Nothing on his life. What did he believe? And he wrote a book called Dispensational Truth. It ought to be called Dispensational Lies. Uh, okay, back to verse 6. And now ye know what withhold it, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Personally, I think who's let, taken out of the way is Michael, the angel. But that's my opinion. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. Read Job 1 about the power of Satan. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. False miracles, people. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. God's going to trick them into believing a lie because they didn't want him. 
They wanted the devil. They didn't want Christ as king. That they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, if you don't know who the dragon is, uh, Revelation 12 and verse 9 tells you, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So that tells you who the dragon is. The devil and Satan. Just like I tell you. I try not to stray too far from the Bible, and if something's my opinion, I try to tell you, this is my opinion, I could be wrong, because there's things Christ didn't know, there's things I don't know, trust me. Now, we're going to skip, we're going to come back to this, but Revelation chapter 20, and verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded, for the witness of Jesus. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And that, people, is the mere introduction. Um, when people tell you that... Um, you know, soul sleep like the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. Uh-uh. No. I don't think so. All right, let's look at uh, Revelation 6 and verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, what altar? The altar of God. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. You see, these are just the souls of the people. They were, their physical bodies were killed, and they have yet to receive their new spiritual bodies, their resurrected bodies. So, you know, and they're, well, let's read verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice, Huh, the souls under the altar, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And guess what? The Lord says, Oh, you got to wait a little while. We're not finished yet down there. Uh, well, yeah, that's the Bob paraphrase, but let's go ahead and read it. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And somebody commented that uh, Revelation was in chronological order, and I say it's not. Well, read Revelation chapter 6. You know, there's 22 chapters, um, and you can read here the sixth seal, and then there's the earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, and the moon became as blood, the stars from heaven fell, uh, the heavens departed as a scroll, uh, the kings of the earth and everybody hid themselves in the rocks and the dens and the mountains. And uh, they say, for the great day of his wrath has come, who shall be able to stand? Well, Revelation 6 is a long ways away from Revelation chapter 22. So, Revelation is not exactly in chronological order. Parts of it are, parts of it are not. It skips around. And I think the Lord does that to confound the wicked. All right, so it's going to be economic, military-wise. Uh, there's the uh, false prophet and the beast are going to have power. And who's going to be able to confront them? 
Well, let's take a look. Now remember, John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah, or Elias, the Greek rendering. But before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, uh, there's Elijah's going to come. And I believe we're going to read about this in uh, Revelation chapter 11. Now, the they talk about the Great Tribulation being seven years. Uh, I kind of look at it like this. The time of sorrows is the first three and a half years, and then the last three and a half years, 42 months, it's going to be hell on earth. And people are going to really have to choose between Christ or Antichrist. And a lot of people are going to lose their faith. Well, their lukewarm, what little lukewarm faith they had. I mean, if you're going to have to stand strong, people. I'm telling you. I just pray almost every day, Lord, give me your strength. Because, you know, uh, what did Jesus tell him in the garden? Um, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Oh, yeah. Revelation 11, verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now this leads me to believe that there's going to be a temple. And I don't know. I mean, you know, read it. I mean, you know. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. Now, didn't we read in, um, I forget what book, was it Malachi? Uh, it said that, um, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And I think I'm paraphrasing, but it's pretty close. We read that earlier. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, about 42 months. I think it's going to be Elijah and Enoch, but could be Moses. But the thing is, you're going to have the false prophet probably saying that he's Elijah, and then you're going to have the two witnesses. One of them's going to be Elijah. And uh, there's going to be a little battle here. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Sackcloth, people, was a sign of humility. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. What do candlesticks do? They give you light. And the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. Now, does that mean their mouths are flamethrowers like in the army? No. No. Remember Elijah said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven or let fire come down from the sky. And it did. Well, fire is going to come down from their mouth. You know, it's a figure of speech. You know, they're not going to have flames shooting out of their lips. No, I don't. Well, maybe, but I don't think so. Fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So if somebody shoots a gun at him, he's going to be killed probably with the same bullet. I don't know. Verse 6. These have power to shut heaven, 
that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Guess what? Elijah, in the days of Ahab and King Jezebel, or Queen Jezebel, uh, it didn't rain for, I think, like three years. It didn't rain. You know what happens to your crops if it doesn't rain for three years? Yeah, you got a problem. And who turned the waters to blood? Uh, Moses in Egypt? The plagues of Egypt prior to the Passover? And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. They're going to have the power to, to plague the earth just like Moses did with Egypt. Verse 7, And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. It's going to take the beast himself to come out of the bottomless pit to kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. Uh, where was the Lord Jesus crucified? Jerusalem. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves, and they shall that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying to, unto them, Come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Boy, that's going to be an eye-opener, huh? There's going to be a lot of true remnant Jews that are going to look at this and go, Wow, the Christians were right. We killed our Messiah. A remnant, people. A remnant. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and, the, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrightened and gave glory to the God of heaven. There you go. Remember uh, in the, um, at the crucifixion, there was an earthquake? Remember? And there's going to be a great earthquake here, too. And a tenth part of the city fell. Ten percent of the city is going to fall. And there's going to be slain of men, 7,000, in the earthquake. And there's going to be a remnant that are going to be frightened and give glory to the God of heaven. Praise the Lord for that. Now, I have another Bible study. I'm going to have to put a link in it in the description and the comments. Uh, who is Mystery Babylon? And if you think it's Rome, um, well, that's very popular. Some people say Mecca, others Istanbul, um, because they all have seven hills, seven mountains on which they're built. But guess what? So does Jerusalem. So does Moscow. So does Seattle, Washington. Microsoft. Moscow, uh, communism. Those are all candidates. But you got to remember something. Mystery Babylon killed the prophets. Did God ever send prophets to Moscow or Washington, Microsoft, or the USA, or Mecca, or Istanbul? Where did God send the prophets to? Um... Did he ever send prophets to Rome? Well, maybe Paul. Paul was the one that wrote the book of Romans. Uh, 
He was the only prophet that I know of that ever went to Rome. Where did God send the prophets? Jerusalem. Think about it. And if the beast is going to rule from a temple, where are they going to build the temple? If they do build one. Jerusalem. End time Jerusalem is going to be the seat of the beast. My opinion. Revelation chapter 17. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple, royalty, right? And scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. There's a verse in the Bible where the Lord says that Babylon hath been a golden cup in my hand. Because he used Babylon to punish Judah and Jerusalem during the Babylonian captivity. And that, everybody, is in Jeremiah 51 and verse 7. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. Not angry, insane. All right, let's see. Verse 4, Revelation 17, verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now listen carefully. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. There's people whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are five kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb. Ah, maybe that's what the space force is for, right? These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth, remember the beast that rose out of the sea? Well, here's the interpretation. The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. 
and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Remember we read about the great city, which is uh, like Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Where was Lord Jesus crucified? Jerusalem, not Rome, not Rome, not Rome. What city killed the saints of Christ? You know, it was, you know, everybody points at Rome, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says it was Jerusalem. Jerusalem killed the saints of God in Christ. But you know who's, you know who's killed Christ. Pilate tried to release him. Remember, that was in a previous study. Pilate tried to release Jesus. Didn't work, but he tried. How about Matthew 23, 37? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. It wasn't Rome that killed the prophets. It wasn't Rome that killed the saints of Christ. It was Jerusalem. The, they didn't want to upset the theological apple cart. No, we want to keep the temple and so we can collect our little tithes. You know, we don't want people going to Christ. And besides that, uh, where were the two, you know, the two witnesses, the two prophets? Where do they get killed? Jerusalem. Um, in Revelation 18.24, And in her was found the blood of prophets and of, of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. They're talking about Babylon here, people. Verse Revelation 16, 6, For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. For thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Ah, Jerusalem killed the saints. Jerusalem killed the prophets. Where do people come get off saying, oh, Mystery Babylon's the USA, or Mystery Babylon's Mecca, or Istanbul, or Rome, for that matter? I mean, the Bible explains the Bible, period. But I got a link. I'll, I'll put links to those Bible studies if anybody's interested. And you can check it out. Because you know what, people? I, have a, I got a bad feeling. My channel's not going to be up for long. And when the Lord deletes my channel on YouTube, um, I'm going to take that as a hint to start getting ready for what's coming. So, like I say, send me an email, give you my address, send me a USB thumb drive. I'll be happy to send you all my work and you can do whatever with it, whatever you want. You can put it up on a wall and use it as a dartboard as far as I care. But uh, if you want to share it with other people, you know, I like I say, I don't, I don't charge, you know. Oh, but I got a new book coming out, and it's only nineteen ninety five. And if you order now, you get a holy water from the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized, and you get a piece of a prayer shawl that was blessed by the rabbi. And the shipping and handling is only thirteen dollars and twenty two cents. Order now. No, I don't do that, do I? No. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. So let's take a look at one more thing. Uh, let's go to chapter 21 of the book of Revelation. I tell you what, people, I've read the book. I've read the last chapter. I know who wins. 
Revelation 21, verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Why a new earth? Because the old one's polluted with the blood. It's blasphemous. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And that, people, is the end of this series. I honestly think this is, if, if you don't listen to anything else, I think that this is probably one of the most important Bible studies you could ever listen to in your life. Because I'd like to think I've covered pretty much everything uh, in this last hour and 20 some odd minutes of what to expect in the end times. Read Matthew 24, Mark 13. They tell you what to expect. The pre-tribbers, they're going to be caught totally unaware. You know, the Lord warned them what was coming, and they ignored it. Why? Because the pastors, the preachers, the so-called ministers, and I covered that in a previous study too, God blinds them, and they blind the flock. Why? Because they bless those that hate the Lord. So, Prepare, people. Things are going to be rough. Be very, very careful who you befriend. It's going to be a very, very, very small remnant. The future of the church, if we're to go into captivity, will be there. But if not, Revelation chapter 12, the wilderness, we're not going to be able to live in the city. It's just not going to happen. And personally, I believe the Lord's going to provide water and manna, just like in days of old. So, all right, well, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. All glory and honor belong to Him. In Jesus' name, Amen.